Good morning and welcome all who are here. It's nice to see that everyone did come out this morning in the midst of what we have going on. So faith over fear, faith over fear, um, but we are a praying church, so anyone who is visiting, which looks like not anyone today, but thank you all for being here, um, and just keep in mind those who are not, and obviously still continue to pray for our nation and the world in the midst of this pandemic. So now the prayer theme, the prayer theme of this week is called, Dear God, I am so amazed and thankful that I heard you calling to me, that amid all the noises of this world, your voice saying, come, follow me is the song that rose above all else. I am so amazed and thankful that you gave no heed to who I was on this earth, to what I was doing or had done, and called me to be yours, knowing what you could do with me. Please get me, my old self, out of the way so that the transformation you have created in my life can serve as hope for those who cannot see beyond their failures and inadequacies. Please remove all human hangups, baggage, and insecurities so that the freedom and joy of a life lived in divine grace can be more visible to those who are yet enslaved. Please remove all my bitterness, my resentments, and my grudges so that all those I meet will know I serve a merciful God, will know that I serve a savior who had mercy on me. Please use me in whatever way you can, whatever way you see fit. Make my life matter in the only way that really matters, by using me to show the world your amazing love. Fill me with your spirit, Take out whatever else is in me and fill me with your love, with one desire, to use every second I have, every moment I am given, every situation in which I find myself, to show those who are still lost in whom they can find their salvation. Amen. Lots of things face our world, and many times... What we need to do is pause to pray. If you'll bow with me. Father, we know that there are many things happening on this earth that you've created. But one thing we know is you created it. You created each one of us. And that we all belong to you. And we're thankful. But at the same time, we know that evil exists. We know that there are many things that happen in this earth, whether it's what we call natural disasters or our sickness or plagues or even a virus. We ask you, O oh God, to comfort this world, to comfort each one. We ask you to bring peace. We ask you to bring that calming that healing that only you can bring. So on this Sunday, as we've joined together, we lift up our hearts and our minds to you in request of you that your mighty love and mercy and kindness and grace will cover this earth and bring about a calmness and a healing. In the name of Jesus, amen. I chose, uh, as I continue to talk to you about the great things that Jesus has done, I chose one of my favorite pictures, which actually comes from one of the scenes in, the, in a movie about Jesus. And I've always loved this picture and what it uh, encompasses a God who so chose to come in this earth and take on human flesh. And in that human flesh, Jesus the Christ calls us to come, calls us to come to the Father. In moments of stress, in moments of where I don't have 
or understand a given situation. There's an old song that always comes out. It's a song that says, where could I go? Oh, where could I go? Seeking a refuge for my soul. Needing a friend to help me in the end. Where could I go but to the Lord? And I can't tell you the number of times in, in my lifetime that I've drawn upon a, a hymn like that to remind me that no matter what is happening, I have a Lord that is always there for me. Sometimes we forget that some of the old songs have such a meaning to them. And those words, where can I go but to the Lord? I don't know a better place to go than to go to the Lord. I don't know a better place to be than in the arms of a Lord who so loved me that he sacrificed everything for me. In Mark chapter 5, we're told that there are many people that followed Jesus. They crowded around him to the point that sometimes there was no breathing room. And there were times that he would go off by himself. At the beginning of Mark chapter 5, we find this is one of those times. It's during one of the festivals, the Jewish festivals, that Jesus has made a journey. And for the most part, he seems to be alone in making this journey. But in the midst of what he's doing, and this is the context of this Mark 5, there is a, a synagogue ruler of that day that comes to Jesus and says, I have no place to go but to you. For I have a child that's dying. I need you. There's no place I can go but to you. And so Jesus will journey with this official of the synagogue. A father, a parent, a child, a daughter. She will die if he, if father, this parent cannot find a way to help his child. But he doesn't have the power. Jesus, come go with me, please. Come to my house. And, and you keep in the context, Mark does not spend a lot of time tracking the beginnings, the birth of Jesus. He doesn't get into the stories of Mary and Joseph and others. He gets into the ministry of Jesus. And most of what Mark writes is really the last part of Jesus' life. And so he jumps right in and says that with this crowd around Jesus that he makes a journey to this synagogue leader's house. There are many people that would not have invited Jesus. For Jesus was criticized as being one who spent too much time drinking wine. He spent too much time associating with the wrong part of society. He spent too much time touching the lives of others that were unclean, that were the outcast of society. He came under a lot of fire. The synagogue leader was risking everything for his child's life. He was risking being coming an outcast himself. So this, this is a story about a parent wanting his child to be healed and not having any resources left but someone called Jesus. And he goes to Jesus. But so much of, of what happens in the stories of Jesus is what sometimes we've called through the years a serendipity that's going to happen. So Jesus, as he makes a journey with the, the synagogue leader, and, and you've got to understand the crowd is amazed 
What is this Jewish leader doing coming to Jesus? Jesus has been condemned by the Pharisees and the Sadducees. What is this guy doing? And can Jesus do it? And will he do it? And why would he do it? So the crowd's going to follow. There's nothing like being placed forefront of everything, knowing that everybody was watching you, wondering, what are you going to do? Will you succeed or will you fail? In that crowd, there were those that would have said, I hope he succeeds. There were those in that crowd that says, I hope he fails. There were some in the crowd that says, don't know anything about him, but the crowd's going that way, so I'll head that way. So there's all sorts of emotions here. So they're making a short journey from where Jesus, the crowd had began to form around Jesus, is now going with him to the synagogue leader's house. In the midst of that crowd, actually on the outskirts, probably before the crowd started, there was a woman. This is once upon a time. There was a woman. What Mark tells us about this woman, this woman has been harmed and hurt by a diseased body. She has no place to go. There's no one that's been able to help her. For years, her, she has suffered in pain. But not just the pain of a body that's diseased. But she, because of her disease, is seen as an outcast. She is one of those that 2,000 years ago would have been called unclean. She is unholy. You can't be around her. She stands on the very outside of the crowd, on the outskirts of the crowd. What does she know about Jesus? As far as Mark tells us here, she doesn't know much. She sees the crowd. She knows where the crowd is going. Verse 25 says she had suffered in the hemorrhage for 12 years. No one could help her. She had gone to every healer around but no one could help her. She spent every dime she had trying to find a cure in some way. Mark tells us in verse 25, 26, that she had not grown better, but her disease had grown worse. Verse 27 is a passage that tells you that she heard about Jesus. She heard that something was different about him. She heard that here's someone that could heal her. She decides on a course of action. Always bear in mind she is the outcast. This crowd of people if they'd known she was there, many in that crowd would have run her off. They'd probably picked up stones and thrown at her. She was unacceptable to this crowd. But she wanted to reach out to the Lord. She wanted to find someone who could touch her and help her. So as you read through the text, and I'm just skimming it with you here, she thought to herself, verse 27, 28, and 29, if I can only get close to Jesus and touch him. Touch him. I, I know I've heard 
hundreds of sermons and read lots of things from different commentaries about that. But I see a woman, because of those last 12 years, no one touched her. No handshakes, no hugs, no anything. No invitations to come eat. No one is going to befriend her. Her disease separated her from everyone. She lived a life of isolation. She was quarantined from everyone and everything. But she manages. And, 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 and here in my imagination, I see, I see a lady that, that covers her head. She hides herself as best she could. And she makes her way through the crowd. But even then she knows that she is doing what society condemns. And I'm sure as she eased her way through the crowd, she tried not to touch anyone. She finally gets to Jesus, reaches out and touches him. In 12 years, she had not touched anyone. In 12 years, she had not felt the touch of anyone. In 12 years of isolation, the human contact was not there. I mean, today, in the midst of this virus that we're facing, we don't shake hands, we don't hug each other. For me, that's hard. That's hard. It's just unbelievable that we face it. When I think about this woman, it wasn't for a short period of time that we're facing whatever time that's going to take for us to get through this crisis. For 12 years, she had been that way. That's astonishing to me. But the moment she touched Jesus, she was healed. There's three things I want you to see in this story I want to share with you. The first was, Jesus was this woman's last hope. She had no place else to go. Where can I go but to the Lord? You know, that, that's that song laying in my mind. And how many times in life I thought, I don't know what to do next. I don't know where to go next. But I do know I can go to the Lord. I do know that I can pray. I do know that I can trust him. And I do know that this world belongs to my Lord. And so she, she had no hope. This was her last hope. But what she found in Jesus was the compassion. You've heard me say it already for two weeks in a row now, this concept of compassion. It is a, an emotion and a feeling that is divinely driven. Sometimes what we call compassion is nothing more than we feel sorry for someone. Jesus doesn't just feel sorry for her. He is compassionate. Look at the story for a moment. Jesus stops what he's doing and immediately says, who touched me? Of course, the disciples that are with him say, man, how would you know who touched you? Look at this multitude. They have crowded around you. They have followed you. You have been touched. You have been pushed. You have been shoved. Everybody wants to be around you. What do you mean who touched you? There, there, there's got to be a hundred people or more that's touched you. Verse 32, he looked all around and then he focused on the woman. You see, his compassion wasn't just about saying, I'm sorry. His compassion comes from a power that says, you touch me, you're healed. You're with me and you're healed. You're with me and I will not forget you. You're with me and I will provide for you rest and peace. Come to me and I will give you what is needed. I've come to give you life. Not just any life but an abundant life. I've come to show you a way. I've come to provide truth for you. 
I've come to be what you need in life so that you can carry on in life. And then we're not talking about here, you know, having some food. We're talking about what we need to make it through. His compassion comes from a power that says, I can do all things. There are many times I felt for people, but I can't take away the disease. How many times I've sat in a hospital room and watched a person die and wanted to do something and have no power to do it. All it took was to touch Jesus and the power flowed from him. And that's what he says here in the text. He says, the power came out of me. They had no concept of what that meant. But compassion is about having not just a feeling for someone, but Jesus defines compassion in terms of, I will not only feel, but I will do what is necessary. So that's why sometimes I struggle with words in our English language. For Jesus being compassionate meant he could also change a life in an instant. But just the touch of a hem of a garment. Third thing I want you to see in this text was that, that Jesus, this woman, had his total attention. He's in a crowd of people. All of you have been in crowds before. You see the crowd, but someone asks you later who was in the crowd. Well, I don't know, it was a bunch of people. What did they look like? I don't know, just people. I mean, you know, it, it's hard for us sometimes in a crowd of people to focus on anyone particular. But Jesus does. He stops and he moves his whole body focused on the woman and he doesn't take his focus away from her Jesus had the woman's total attention he gave her everything he had and he kept her attention on him total attention in the midst of the, the virus and the times that uh, we're facing today sometimes in the midst of our attention and I don't mean to sound mean but we're more concerned about getting the toilet paper off the shelves than we are in giving an encouraging word to someone who is sick and hurting we sometimes have forgotten that our attention should be focused on the greatest of all of God's creation and that is the human beings that we are. We are created in the image of God. And in the rush of, of facing a crisis, we're more concerned about accumulating goods than we are about helping a life to get through the crisis that they're in. There's one thing in all these years of ministry that I've struggled with. There are times at night that I think about the people I've met throughout the day and I find myself struggling, sometimes in the midst of tears, of knowing there was nothing I could do to help them. But for Jesus, that was never the case. He could walk up to a tomb and he could call someone out and they would come from the tomb, from the grave. You see, Jesus did not think in terms of a crowd. Jesus thought in terms of individuals. He could focus on one individual who needed exactly what he could give. And in life, so often we, we're in the midst of a crowd and we don't understand if we look around, there are individuals that need our attention. So in this weeks that we're going to face of isolation, in these weeks of where we're going to struggle because of the virus that exists, 
They're individuals that are alone. Send them a note. Call them. Don't just isolate yourself. Reach out and touch the life of those around us. And you're going to find some that really need to be comforted. Provide the comfort. Maybe instead of, I'm sorry, I, I'm, I'm on a roll on this. Instead of going to the store to rush to pull something off the shelf, maybe you take it to someone who could not go to the store. Maybe it's providing for someone that has no one else to provide for them. So when you think about this story, and, and the, the context isn't really this woman. It's about Jesus going with the leader of a synagogue to heal his daughter. In the midst of it, he stops what he does, what he's doing. He stops the course of action that he's taken. For once upon a time, there was a woman in the crowd that had no one but him. And he touched her life. Of course, the other part of that story is the daughter of the synagogue leaders is also healed. You see, Jesus does not forget. Even while he's interrupted and, and ends up going down a different path, he never fails to remember why he started on that path. And he started on that path to heal a daughter, to touch the child of a parent, but in the midst, he touched a life that had no one else but him. I love this story. I love the Lord that we serve. I know in the midst of all that we face, we have someone to go to, and his name is Jesus.